This presentation will provide you with a brief introduction to Broadcom Ethernet NIC and their associated protocols and standards. Let's start with just what an Ethernet NIC is and what it's used for. First, NIC stands for Network Interface Card or Controller. A NIC is simply a system expansion card for connecting to a network by way of an Ethernet cable. A NIC implements the electronic circuitry and onboard firmware logic required to communicate using standard Ethernet physical and data link layers. It will do that by getting network packets from the host's memory and transferring them over the network cable, then reversing that by processing incoming packets and getting those into the host memory. Today's Broadcom NICs also implement numerous offload capabilities, which can do certain networking related calculations for the host system, thereby saving host CPU cycles. As networking speeds have gotten faster and consequently more burdensome, these NIC offload capabilities have become that much more important. Next, let's cover today's common server NIC form factors. Up top is a traditional PCI Express stand-up NIC. On the bottom is an OCP 3.0 compliant adapter. The first example shown is a Broadcom Thor-based dual 100 gig QSFP56 stand-up NIC. This one supports 16 lanes of PCI Express at Gen 4. This NIC will always be backwards compatible with previous PCI Express generation capabilities as well. However, that can then limit overall NIC bandwidth capability. We'll discuss that more in an upcoming slide. The second example shows a Broadcom Thor-based single port 100 gig QSFP56 OCP 3.0 compliant adapter. This adapter also uses 16 lanes of PCI Express and is again Gen 4 capable. For those not familiar with the OCP standard, this comes from the Open Compute Project standard specification for a PCI Express NIC. It's the result of an open community driven standard, which has gained quite a bit of industry support in recent years and enables a NIC from any vendor to work in any OCP 3.0 compliant system. Another thing I'd like to draw your attention to on this slide are the blue boxes at the edge connectors of these two boards. Notice that with the OCP 3.0 design, some pins are noticed as NCSI, which provides management capabilities via a server BMC. These are not available in a stand-up NIC. There are also some additional pins noted as miscellaneous, and we'll touch on those in the next slide. Okay, so here we break out the Broadcom OCP 3.0 NIC in a little more detail. So just going from left to right, the I.O. represents the connectors or, or cages where the Ethernet cables attach. The controller represents the actual Broadcom Thor network controller chip, which is obviously the brains of the device. The NVRAM at the bottom of the controller is just storage, and that's where the device's boot code and firmware are stored. Then we get back to the various interfaces brought out by the OCP defined edge connector. As we noted in the previous slide, the defined pins not only provide power and PCI connectivity to the host, but also bring out NCSI management connectivity and some special pins referred to as BIF pins. The BIF pins are bifurcation pins. This allows an OCP 3.0 NIC to support various personalities and configure itself dynamically based on signals driven by the host server. An example of this would be in a multi-host server application where the NIC can actually be shared by more than one host. If, for example, a server chassis held two independent servers, the chassis could indicate to the NIC via the BIF pins that it wants the NIC to split the 16 PCIe lanes into two sets of eight, routing each to a separate host. Broadcom's NIC firmware would then support this personality and allow two hosts to connect and share the total bandwidth. This slide provides some high-level background on PCIe to help set up the understanding of how it affects the NIC's performance. On the left, there's a very simple diagram showing how system CPUs are connected to the motherboard's chipset via the root complex, then to a PCIe switch, and finally to the PCIe endpoint, which in this case is obviously going to be the NIC. A PCIe, uh, in PCIe, it's a point-to-point -point serial link connecting an endpoint to the root complex and allowing communication via encapsulated packets. Of course, the more links you have, referred to as lanes, the greater the potential bandwidth. Now let's look at how that actually translates into bandwidth with a given PCIe connection. In the first column, labeled PCIe Gen versions, we see Gen 1 through 5. Each generation of PCIe doubles the throughput capability of each of the lanes, as shown in the second column. 
going from 2.5 giga transfers at Gen 1 and then doubling with each gen up to today's Gen 5 at 32 giga transfers per second. In the next four columns, we show how that translates to the potential bandwidth when multiplied by either 8 or 16 lanes. This is important in understanding whether a server's PCIe slot can support the bandwidth requirements of a given NIC. The NIC can operate in a slower slot, but of course it may not be able to reach its maximum speed capabilities. In the bottom right, we give you an example of a Broadcom 200 gig NIC and its requirements. In order for that NIC to perform to its potential, it would require 16 lanes at Gen 4. However, it could accomplish the same level of performance with only 8 lanes if it were at Gen 5. The Thor NIC controller chip has 8 Surtees lanes that can operate in two different encoding modes. These lanes can be mapped to the physical ports in various combinations to accommodate the intended speeds. The encoding mode being used will determine the maximum speeds the connector is capable of. The encoding methods supported by Broadcom's current Thor-based adapters are called NRZ and PAM4. In the case of NRZ, the maximum speed per Surtees lane is 25 gig. PAM4 doubles this to 50 gig. So in the two examples on the bottom right, we first show how 200 gig capable ports can be configured using only four of the available eight lanes. PAM4 encoding at 50 gig per lane would be needed for this example. In the rightmost example, we can accomplish the same dual 100 gig port capability with NRZ. However, then we require all eight lanes. In this slide, we'll quickly cover the NCSI interface. The Network Controller Sideband Interface, or NCSI, provides an interface to the server's Baseboard Management Controller, or BMC. For context, you might be familiar with popular vendors' BMC implementations like Dell's iDRAC or HP's ILO. These are examples that use the NCSI interface. NCSI defines both the electrical interface as well as the protocol. NCSI supports multiple bus types for connection, including RMII, SMBus, I2C, or PCIe VDM. Communication via numerous protocols listed here are then supported over these buses. Understanding connector types and their corresponding capabilities and capable requirements has become much more complex. So most of us are familiar with the old RJ45 connector where we only had to worry about Cat5e twisted pair for a, like a common one gig network, or maybe Cat6 in the case of a 10G based T application. Today's high-speed interconnects require a little more technical understanding. And this is where the understanding of those Surtees lanes and the encoding methods becomes very important. For example, we can see in the middle SFP column how a single multi-rate Surtees lane can achieve up to 50 gig. And again, this of course requires PAM4 and lower speeds would not require PAM4. In the rightmost column, we show a QSFP, or quad SFP, meaning four lanes. There again, we can see that this connector would be needed to achieve speeds as high as, say, 200 gig. And then again, understanding these connectors and encoding types is critical when choosing the corresponding cables. So for example, a QSFP28 cable will look very much like a QSFP56 cable and has the same connector interface but that's not going to work in an application where PAM4 is needed. Notice the middle breakout cable example, which is interesting. Breakout cables are often used to maximize the use of available switch ports. In the case of a QSFP28 to SFP28 breakout cable as shown here, we would configure a single QSFP switch port to split each of its four lanes into individual 25 gig links. That cable can then send a single lane to each of the four SFP connectors. Next, we'll briefly cover the NIC's Linux kernel driver. This driver is responsible for communication with the NIC and the kernel. Broadcom's L2 driver is an open sourced and upstreamed to the mainline kernel. In a standard Linux configuration, all data passes through the kernel and its network software stack. Another type of driver called a DPDK driver is supported on Broadcom Thor NIC as well. The DPDK driver improves performance by bypassing the kernel. Instead, DPDK kernel module simply facilitates access to memory and needed libraries. This is useful for special high-performing applications that are able to take advantage of the improved performance. Broadcom's DPDK driver 
is also open sourced and also available upstream via the DPDK project. And yet another high performance network protocol supported by Broadcom adapters is called Rocky, which stands for RDMA over converged Ethernet. Rocky is useful in applications that require very high performance and very low latency. The graphic on the left illustrates the standard Linux driver model that we first covered. This one can be very heavy lifting in terms of host CPU utilization and also will have higher network latency as compared to Rocky. The graphic on the right is intended to illustrate a Rocky implementation which facilitates the ability of one server to write directly into the memory of the opposing server without even involving the host CPUs. This obviously benefits both system and network performance. Broadcom NICs also support a number of stateless offload features that help improve network performance and reduce CPU cycles needed for network operations. The basic offloads include checksum offload for IP, TCP, UDP, allowing the NIC to handle checksum calculations, TCP segmentation offload or large send offload to handle data segmentation, transparent packet aggregation to improve efficiency and reduce overhead, and header and data split to improve performance and CPU efficiency, and VLAN insertion and removal to offload the tagging. Packet steering is also employed via RSS and RFS to help distribute receive processing more evenly across the available CPU cores. For more product information, product specific data sheets, or additional training videos, please go to broadcom.com. From the initial landing page, just click on the product links and navigate to wired connectivity and Ethernet network adapters.